Hi, welcome to my talk on ahead of time compiled BPF trace programs. This is a pre recorded talk, so if there's any questions while I'm giving this talk, hopefully the host can pause the video and then I can answer some of the questions via VC or chat. If not, there will be plenty of time for questions at the end. So before I begin, as a disclaimer, uh, I assume you know what BPF trace is and that you've used BPF trace in some simple use cases. If not, I would encourage you to, you know, pause the video, watch another talk, play with BPF Trace, and then come and watch a recording of this talk later, as it'll probably make a lot more sense. So BPF Trace's current compilation model is totally dynamic. So for example, uh, given this Hello World script I have on the screen, once you hit Enter, BPF Trace will build the bytecode from scratch, load the bytecode into the kernel. Once the kernel verifies the bytecode, uh, BPF trace will then attach the progs to the appropriate attach points. So in general, this is pretty okay if you're writing a one-off script, if you're just trying things out. But things get pretty wasteful if you're, attached, if you're running the same script on multiple hosts or multiple times. So for example, if you've developed some kind of BPF trace based tool and you're going to deploy it to a million machines, uh, all this work has to be done or redone for every single host. And especially in the case of this Hello World script, the output is totally deterministic. The bytecode will never change no matter where you run it. Uh, examples of places where the bytecode might change depending on the host are if you, when you use trace points, because trace points could be added or removed from the kernel, new fields could be added. Uh, if you're pound including any uh, header files, we would need to reprocess these header files every time because the header files don't have to be the same across different hosts and kernel versions. Uh, and obviously we'd have to reparse BTF definitions, uh, BPF type format, because uh, the BTF shows you the you know, internal data structures the kernel uses, and these data structures change pretty often depending on which version the kernel you're on. But you know, by and large, most of the work, like semantic analysis and field analysis, that is the same no matter where you run it. So I bet you're probably wondering now, why is BPF trace set up to have a dynamic compilation model? Uh, well, for starters, a dynamic compilation model is pretty straightforward to implement. Any information you need from the host, you can pretty trivially access it. For example, if you need to know which kernel functions are available to trace, you can just go open up the file in sysfs and then uh, see what events are available. This is a little trickier to handle if you're doing things ahead of time. Uh, furthermore, uh, things like struct layout, symbol addresses, trace point fields, if, for example, the user accesses a field in a struct and you compile it ahead of time, now you have to handle the case where uh, what if that field is missing or what if it's moved? Uh, so if you compile things dynamically on the target host, these layouts and these offsets are much more straightforward to handle. You can just assume whatever you find is the reflects whatever you find in the BTF or the kernel headers reflects reality. However, to pay for this um, simplicity of implementation, there's a number of disadvantages to having the dynamic compilation model. Uh, the first disadvantage is that shipping and running LLVM on production hosts is pretty expensive in terms of size, memory, and CPU binary size. Uh, LLVM is not really known to be lightweight in terms of uh, binary size, memory consumption, or CPU usage. For example, in the past, we've, uh, we've done bad cogen and admitted bad uh, IR intermediate representation to LLVM. And then LLVM all of a sudden goes and uses one to two gigs of memory to try and compile this bad IR. And this can be pretty bad if you're doing this production. You can knock over workloads like that pretty easily. Another disadvantage is that time to first trace is slow because we have to run all the analysis. We have to do semantic analysis. We have to do cogen. We have to look at all the fields that people are accessing. We have to pull BTF from the kernel. We have to parse BTF, all that stuff. And then we have to do runtime setup, like create all the maps, load the progs, wait for the kernel to verify, stuff like that. And so uh, we can dramatically reduce the amount of time to first, uh, we can dramatically reduce the time to first trace if we compile scripts ahead of time. Uh, and another disadvantage is that it's difficult to sign scripts, especially if you're in you know, security-heavy environments. If you're just shipping um, a .bt BPF trace script, uh, it's hard to say exactly what the machine is going to run if you're running a compiler in production. For example, imagine if you're shipping .c files to production and compiling it on the fly. Like there's, uh, 
uh, security people don't really like that too much. To summarize the last two slides, why AOT? Well, the first reason is we can get smaller binary sizes with AOT built scripts. So for example, I just looked on my host and LLVM takes up 90, almost 100 megs of uh, disk space. And to ship that to every production host, we, that's pretty expensive. And so if we build AOT scripts instead that do not have LLVM built in, hopefully we can save a bunch of disk space on prod hosts plus CPU cycles. Uh, which brings us to the second point, it should be faster to run AOT build scripts as well. Uh, the time to first trace will be lowered and you know, plus we'll stop burning a bunch of cycles on doing duplicated work on all these prod hosts. And the final point is that we can have our cake and eat it as well. So for a long time there's been a trade-off between BPF trace and you know, live BPF based tools. Uh, where BPF trace is easy to develop scripts, you can get something done way faster. Uh, but the downside is it's not very efficient, it's kind of slow. So if you actually want to deploy something in production, you have to sit down for a day or two and write a real libvpf based program. And you know, it takes like a day or two. Even for me, I'm, I would say I'm moderately experienced writing libvpf based tools. It still takes at least one afternoon to write any kind of script. Uh, so hopefully with AOT, we can have the best of both worlds. You can have ease of use and ease of development. And then you can ship an efficient version of it to production when you want. So this is the end goal for AOT compiled BPF trace scripts. Uh, so in the first line, you can see it's the same hello world script that I had a couple of slides ago, except this time there's a dash dash AOT out that BTAOT uh, flag appended to the end. And this tells BPF trace you want to compile an AOT script and you want the output placed in that file name. On the next line, we run file against it and we discover that out.btot is just a executable file. Uh, in the next line, the third line, we run LDD against it and we find out that it's a statically linked executable, meaning that we can just SCP around onto pretty much any Linux host and in theory it should run all right, which is phenomenal. Uh, the fourth line, we run this executable and it runs just like a BPF trace script except, it's, except this is fully hermetic and you can just you know SCP it around. And hopefully it's pretty lightweight as well, uh, lighter, and having a bunch of these is still lighter than shipping LLVM onto production hosts. So this is just the vision. Uh, some of this works, some of it doesn't fully work yet, and some things I don't have a solution for. Uh, there's a bunch of slides later in this presentation about it, so we'll get to all that later. And I'll also you know, show what the current state is. The basic design behind AOT compiled BPF trace scripts is three parts. The first part is we ship a fully executable runtime shim with the BPF trace package. The second part is that when we're compiling the AOT BPF trace script, we're going to first build the metadata, build the bytecode, make a copy of the shim from the package, place that at the user requested location, then take the metadata and bytecode, place that into the special ELF section inside the copied shim, thus completing the final executable. The third and final part is that when the shim runs, it knows to look inside itself at that special ELF section. It'll then pull out the metadata and bytecode, reconstruct all the data structures, and then begin execution like a regular dynamically compiled BPF trace script would. Uh, hopefully this design seems pretty simple, at least it's pretty simple to me, but as with all things, uh, the devil's really in the details here. There's a lot of details to consider, and I'll go over that uh, later as well. This slide is basically a visual describing more in depth what I was talking about the last slide. Uh, there's no real need to stare at this too hard. It's mostly implementation details, like I have some a few key functions uh, drawn in the sequence diagram. It's basically saying we're going to add another code path for ALT compile. And that, uh, so if you look at the green highlighted thing, relocate map FDs, um, and there's an arrow saying maybe more relocations here too. Basically saying the bytecode that we ship will need to be fixed up before we load into the kernel because there's things we just simply don't know at compile time. For example, we don't know what the map file descriptors are going to be. So we need to fix that up at runtime. 
Uh, we may need to add more relocations there as well. For example, if we're trying to relocate field offsets or field field accesses, uh, and field the field might move inside a structure uh, depending on the kernel version, we might need to fix that up as well. So we we need to have that step. And then there's another arrow in the middle saying see you next slide. Uh, we're going to need to add some more passes to the uh, AST passes as well in order to collect all the metadata we need to serialize. This slide is more implementation details. What it, pretty much what it's saying is we're going to add a couple more AST passes. Uh, the first pass we're going to add is to the AOT compiler code path. Um, that's the non-portable feature check. And that exists as a development tool. Uh, the reason is I don't want to implement AOT all at once because there's too many things to do. I want to slowly start shipping code gradually with more features over time. And so what this pass does is block features that AOT doesn't support yet. So for example, uh, we're not supporting relocatable field, uh, struct field accesses off the bat. We're just going to simply disable accessing struct fields if you're trying to compile with AOT. And over time, we'll relax these restrictions. Like There's also other probe types that we're not supporting because I need to think more carefully about how it's going to interact with AOT. Uh, another pass we're going to add is gather runtime resource requirements. Uh, that's pretty much another implementation detail. I'll mention it here just in case anyone's curious. Uh, for example, say in your BPF trace script you have a printf and has a format string with a couple parameters and then has a couple arguments to that format string. Well, we're not actually passing the format string itself to the BPF prog because we can't actually do anything with it inside the prog. We can't actually format that format string. Instead, what we're passing to the BPF prog is an ID to uh, in, an ID that indexes into an array of format strings we store in user space. So when the prog decides to send up a printf, it'll send up the printf ID, and then it'll send up the bytes that uh, make up the arguments for that format string. And then when the runtime receives you know, this data, it looks up in the array of format strings, which format string this, you know, packet of data uh, for. It looks up what types the arguments are, and then from there it can interpret the bytes that the prog has sent us. And so what this pass does is it collects all these async IDs uh, into this one structure that we can later serialize into the metadata. Uh, before, this used to be all done as part of CoGen, which was supremely, you know, it was just all mixed in. This just extracts it and makes the logic clear. And then the final pass we're going to add is runtime resource setup. Uh, pr uh, pretty much all this does at this point is create the map file descriptors. It creates the maps. Previously, this was done in CoGen, which is not optimal. It's is better to just split this out into its own pass. This is the final slide for the implementation details. I promise is the last slide. Uh, this one's pretty straightforward. This shows how AOT is, the shim is going to execute. Uh, you know, first extract the metadata, extract bytecode, create the maps, restore the state, and then run. Uh, fairly straightforward. The, the actual shim file is pretty small. So these are the list of solved problems. Uh, and I'll be pretty brief on this because it's not super interesting to talk about the problems I've already solved. Uh, the first problem that I solved was, uh, so the map FDs were hard-coded into the bytecode. So originally the maps were being created during semantic analysis and then embedded straight into the bytecode during cogen. Uh, there's, there's a little too much stuff going on in semantic analysis and cogen, so I split that out into a different path to make things easier to understand. And in the process, this solves up the problem, or this solves the problem of the hard-coded FDs because we simply fix up the fake IDs into the real uh, FDs right before loading into the kernel. Uh, the second problem was how to handle async IDs. So the async IDs are indexes into an array, and so we still have to make sense of this index uh, when we're running an AOT compiled script. So how do you solve this? Well, the simplest way is to ship all the data with the metadata. So we ship the format string and the args and all that stuff with the metadata structure. Uh, third problem. How, how do we drop LLVM and libclang dependencies for the AOT binaries? Well, I really didn't want to ship LLVM and libclang for the AOT binaries because that kind of defeats the purpose of this entire endeavor. Uh, and so the way we, I solved that was two parts. One, first, a new CMake target that creates the AOT runtime target. So this is the shim. Um, so we create a shim, we, we ship that around with the BPF trace package. Uh, and the next, the second part was 
I made a change to the BCC to make the BCC underscore BPF library essentially the BCC runtime. So everything BCC can do minus Clang and LLVM. And this works great because after you have the bytecode, you don't really need any, any of that stuff. Uh, note that this is not completely solved, not a completely solved problem, and I might have it in the next couple of slides in the unsolved problems, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. And then the final solved problem was how do I disable the currently unsupported features? You know, the features that I plan on supporting but haven't supported yet. Well, uh, I already talked about that too, uh, new feature check pass on the compile path. All right, so on to unsolved problems. So for this section of the talk, I welcome any interruptions uh, with people who have ideas, or we can just talk about it after. I'm super interested to hear from anyone who can help me solve these problems. Uh, yeah, without further ado, so how do we create a fully static AOTRT binary? Yeah, well, so is CMake, can we finesse CMake enough to accomplish this? Uh, Currently, the CI, our BPF trace CI, we for every single build on master, we create a fully, a uh, fully static uh, BPF trace binary, and this requires a very specific environment uh, to build. And so, I wonder if you can build a non-fully static AOT or BPF trace binary along with a fully static AOT RT binary. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. And then, w what about BCC? Can we how do we get a fully static BCC going? Uh, I, I think BPF trace, the CI at least already builds BCC fully static. I'm not sure how it does it. So we have to look into that. And what about libc? libc doesn't really work super well with uh, fully static builds. So maybe we have to use uh, Musil or something. I, I don't know. The next unsolved problem is how do we relocate field accesses on kernel structs? So libpf uh, compile once run everywhere has already solved this problem, but it's you have to use libppf to fix up the bytecode, and libppf comes with its own you know framework of how you write B, how you write and run bpf uh, programs. So yeah, do we use that or do we roll a custom solution? Um, so that begs the second question: Is using libppf for loading feasible? Well, the first the first issue I have with that is it would require an enormous amount of BPF trace code changes because right now we, we kind of have our own way of doing things. We have our own test frameworks and stuff like that. And so putting libbpf into there is, is really a non-trivial amount of work. Yeah, like mocking out maps and unit testing, how do you how do you exactly do that with libbpf? Um, third point I have there is there's a lot of extra overhead. Um, or not Currently, we, we do sort of generate L files, but not necessarily in the future because we have plans on creating our own BPF backend uh, to generate bytecode. So we'd have to create an L file, and the way you tell libbpf we want to make these maps is you have these magical um, variables, global variables, in these magical ELF sections saying, oh, this is a map of this type of this size with this name, and then libbpf can extract information and then create the maps for you. And then there's also tension between distro packaging rules and vendoring libbpf, because for libbpf to work the best, we would need to vendor libbpf into bpf trace. And then we've had pushback in the past about uh, any time we've tried to vendor anything. Yeah, I'm not too sure on how to deal with relocating field accesses. I'd have to see how complicated rolling custom solution is. So unsolved, yeah. The next unsolved problem is how do we completely remove LLVM for the AOT binary? So I mentioned a couple slides ago there's one caveat about removing LLVM. So right now the runtime, the BPF trace runtime uses LLVM C++ demangler for symbol demangling. Um, that's because the C++, the C++ provided one uh, does not work very well. I, I, there's some issue that I can't quite remember, but it's either too much memory or it's too slow. And the LVM one is just way better, and I, I just have no idea how we're going to remove this. Maybe we can go back. Maybe the AOT runtime can use the crappy one, and the 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 one in the the regular BPF trace can use the good one. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. So what are we going to do about trace point fields? Are we just going to assume they're stable enough between ho different hosts and different kernels? Are we going to parse the trace points at runtime for the AOT compiled scripts every time. 
in my experience, they've been very stable. So I, I'm cu curious to hear what the larger, you know, more more experienced Linux folks have to say about this. And then the final list of unsolved problems is just kind of a laundry list of stuff I haven't given as much thought about. So first is positional parameters. Right? If you're not aware, positional parameters are essentially like um, format string. So you write a script um, with these positional parameters in it, and then when you actually run the script at runtime, you can pass these, uh, pass the actual values in the command line. And it'll just fill out the script with the values. Um, and so it's like a template. Uh, right now, CodeGen directly places these values into the bytecode or whatever. Uh, so uh, unclear how we're going to actually support this. If we need to support it, maybe we could do read-only map or something at runtime. Uh, the current task built-in gives you like the, the current, uh, you know, the current struct task struct. Uh, we need to support field accesses first before we expose that, because otherwise it's mostly useless to access that. Uh, so that's not a huge deal. We, with the field access support, this will be supported. Um, K adder, U adder, C group ID. So this does a lookup during code gen, I believe, to find the actual values of, the, uh, find the actual addresses of the symbols. And so obviously on different kernels, there'll be the values will be different. So maybe we need to use a read-only map, just like with uh, positional parameters. Uh, USDTs, I have. I think the USDTs will be quite complicated to support. I'm really not sure how to do that yet at all. Uh, because you need to look at the binaries that you're targeting for the precise offset and argument information. And I assume this can change pretty frequently, uh, especially if it's not the exact same binary running on different hosts, the exact same trace E. And then watch points. I, I've given that like no thought at all. I'm, not, I'm just not sure how that would work. Or if it would work at all, maybe it does work. I, I just disabled it just to be safe. Uh, because the internals are a little complicated. There's like setup probes and whatever. So after listening to all of my plans and ideas and problems and unsolved problems, uh, you're probably wondering, do you have a prototype? Does it work at all? Where are you at with this? Well, the good news is, is that I have merged a functional prototype into master. It mostly works, kind of works. Uh, however, with a few caveats, things diverged a little bit from my grand plan, but I'll fix them. The first is that the metadata and bytecode currently exist in a separate file, so it's not embedded into the runtime yet. Uh, there's no huge blocker for that, I just haven't gotten around to it. Uh, it should be really straightforward, it's just a matter of copying over some files around and putting some data in places. Um, so I guess the best example is just one of the tests I have checked into the CI. And this test, uh, you could probably squint along, hopefully can squint along to this. Uh, essentially, we're building a script in AOT mode, placing it into slash temp, and then we're taking the runtime and running um, the compiled stuff. And then it expects a certain output, and it works. Yeah, it works. Any questions? All right, Daniel, I'll give you a presenter and switch to the slides. Hello. Oh, awesome, it works. <clears throat> um, yeah, so there's a question. Um, would you get long-term win through porting over to libbpf with easy to support new features? Uh, maybe, Un it's unclear. Uh, we have all the things we need right now. We don't really use that many fancy uh, libbpf things. Maybe this uh, the bpf linker in the future could be useful if we're using some kind of libraries. Uh, but it's a lot of work, and I think it needs to be thought about because it could easily the initial work could easily outweigh all of the benefits. And also the vendoring. I think libbpf would have to be vendored in order for it to work the best because there's it's just it's just such a pain to handle different versions because right now BPF trace handles like a huge matrix of features because we take all these libraries and dependencies is optional and it'll do different things based on whether or not certain features are present. So that itself presents a huge maintenance cost uh, and would probably be improved if we could vendor it. 
Okay. And do you know what's the status of the alternative BPF backend and BPF trace? And not the one that is not using the LLVM? Uh, so we had, I saw some code come by in like a private repository and it looks like it was setting up some work. I'm not sure what the status is. I don't, I don't, maybe it's paused right now. I think people are kind of busy because I think all the other um, BPF trace maintainers and contributors probably are um, just volunteers. Uh, another question. So <clears throat> you mentioned that core is, well, uh, poses some challenges for the AOT. So do you think that uh, core done by the kernel can help somehow, or dependency on the newest kernel would be too much to bear for the BPF trace? Yeah, I think it could be done using the new kernel stuff. Uh, if we went that direction, I would probably choose to only support the newer kernels because uh, it would, it, it, like individually supporting like um, user space only stuff and supporting the kernel space stuff, those two pieces are pretty big um, pieces of work by themselves. So I'd probably have to choose one or the other. Uh, obviously, I think it'd be really nice to support uh, as many hosts as we can, as many users, because there's like a huge long tail out in the wild of kernels. So, yeah, I think you, you added the, um, the map indirection thing in the kernel, which is great, so I don't have to fix up the map FTs in use space. But unfortunately, yeah, the, it only works for, like, very few people. You are muted. Hey, Jacob, I just want to say that you are muted. Say it again. I don't think any audio is coming through. Oh yeah, the sword K adder. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what's happening right now with um, at runtime or during code gen. We're just reading KL sims, or yeah, I believe it's KL sims. Um, yeah, it's totally doable. It would just be nice to not to do like as little work as possible on um, the AOT runtime path. But yeah, that's what we'd probably have to do, and we'd probably put it into some kind of read-only map that the prog is going to read from, uh, just like with the position parameters, because the I. Fixing up the bytecode would be too much. It would be like a little too complicated for like a string to like add a string to the bytecode. So we probably want to do a map or something. 
Yeah, for a positional parameter, the string would be a constant. Uh, I, I actually don't know how strings work with uh, BPF programs. I would have to look at the details. But I, I assume, like, even if you add the string to the section, um, you would have to fix up the bytecode to read that string. Uh, and that just sounds pretty complicated. I'd rather just take an extra indirection with the map lookup. Uh, that way, everything is unified. Like the dynamic compilation, it works the same as the AOT compilation. So we're not like supporting two different things. One is like way less used than the other. Yeah, maybe we could add a helper for the kernel symbol resolution. But then you, uh, it's like that doesn't fix the um, user space address resolution, though. Maybe that might be too much for a helper. Maybe just better done user space. <laughs> 